Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second part of my presentation on coronavirus 19. In our last video, podcast 705, we made an offer of $5,000 to anyone who could show proof of diagnosis. After thousands of people have seen our video, no one has come forward, not one. So what does that mean? That none of these thousands needs money? No, it means none of them has proof they have a disease. With no proof of disease, how can there be an epidemic? The entire epidemic is theoretical. There is no epidemic today. There is no new disease pervading the earth. It's a sham. The people who are sick and dying are the same ones who are sick and dying of flu every year. Not one death has been the proven result of infection from a novel, isolated COVID virus. Based on pop media, this is the single most successful marketing campaign in human history. There are unlimited resources driving the engines of information. They have created a nation, no, a world, of dociles who no longer have confidence in their own ability to evaluate the daily news, who believe everything they are told. Let's be realistic. For the most part, these bureaucrats spend their careers dedicated to one thing and one thing only, their own personal power and position. We're seeing that every day now. They advance themselves by doing whatever it takes, deception, media control, lies, endangering the public welfare. Nothing new with that approach. It's been around since the dawn of human history. But this video is about the germ theory. If you believe in COVID-19, you have to believe in the germ theory. Ever since Louis Pasteur thought it up, the germ theory of disease has had one objective, sales sales of drugs, vaccines, and procedures. Most are for healthy people. Most are unnecessary. So, the perception of necessity had to be created in order to sell medicines to perfectly healthy people. Fundamental to all sales, of course, is marketing and promotion. Pretense, misdirection, media saturation, whatever it takes to convince people of two things. Number one, there is the threat of disease. Number two, we have the only cure. As we mentioned, there is a way out of this dilemma today. We don't have to wait for all the bureaucrats to keep delaying while they're trying for yet another stimulus package. The slavery we're under is self-imposed. If enough people did the research, on the unreliability of COVID testing and the false reporting of numbers for the past three months, we could all drop our membership in the new state religion, open our doors, open our restaurants and businesses, and go back to work and take our country back. We want to go back to work. We're the workers. We could really do that. That's exactly what we have done for the past 30 years during flu season, kept working just like Sweden. And it never made things any worse. The numbers were about the same every year. So stop saying, this is different. Prove it. We'll give you five grand for proof of diagnosis. Obviously, Sweden has proven the contagion model of Fauci and the World Health Organization has proven it wrong. They never locked down, never signed up for mass hysteria, People went about their lives. Restaurants and schools stayed open. All businesses are open. And guess what? No epidemic. No necessity for radical dismantling of the social order. So here's the question. If this is a global viral pandemic, how can there be a virus that respects geographic borders? There's only one explanation for this. It's a contrived, man-made illusion. Recategorization of cases of a mild disease that makes an annual appearance everywhere. The flu. 
and then creating hysteria based on unreliable science. Snake oil, bleeding bowls, leeches, mercurochrome, chemotherapy, boutique epidemics. You'd think people would figure it out by now that 99% of the time, diseases are misdiagnoses. We usually don't need medicines since the human body, most of the time, is a self-healing organism when left to its own devices. Dr. Rashid Buttar goes in on Bill Gates and Fauci. Here's a paraphrase of some of the things that Dr. Buttar says. Every scientist who knows that this is a fraud needs to open his mouth and speak the truth. Every aspect of virology and infectious disease is being ignored. Hospitals are being instructed if people come in with the symptoms of the flu, don't bother testing them, just send them home with a diagnosis of COVID. No one can go to church, but everyone must believe in the germ theory. So the germ theory is now our new state religion. It has replaced these other religions in a very real sense. I keep asking myself why I'm talking to all these college-educated people. The only thing that comes out of their mouths is recycled media slogans. I know they're not stupid. They've just become very, very lazy because they now accept anything they hear on pop media at face value as gospel truth without asking for any evidence whatsoever. I saw it on NBC, so it must be true. Essential in maintaining the germ theory mythology is the fable of obsessive personal hygiene, killing germs on and around your body all day, every day. Hand sanitizers are made primarily of alcohol and water. While these may inhibit microbial activity on the skin, the real question is, do skin bacteria need to be killed at all? The vast majority are harmless. Always ask the question, who benefits from promoting this general belief? Well, for starters, the $74 million hand sanitizer industry. As usual, money underlies the myth. The essential lie of the obsession with clean hands assumes a fact that is not in evidence. That fact is, there is no proven new virus to defend from. This is all marketing. What about face masks? This program of disinformation has been so successful that we should be truly embarrassed as a nation that we are so gullible and undiscerning. So what's the theory there? Masks keep the disease bugs out, right? And that will supposedly prevent this non-existent epidemic from spreading. Is that it? No one seems to question this notion. It's not open for discussion. But the fact is, any protection from COVID viruses is a scientific impossibility. For starters, let's just look at the numbers for face masks, okay? The average face mask uses a 16 gauge mesh in which the pores are 1.29 millimeters. The average size of a virus is about 250 nanometers. There are 1 billion nanometers in a meter. So that means that viruses could march 5,000 abreast through that mesh opening in your mask. A better illustration might be this. The Golden Gate Bridge spans 1,300 meters, okay? Let's say your kayak is about a meter wide. For a virus to penetrate your face mask, that would be just as easy as paddling your kayak under a bridge that was four times as long as the Golden Gate. Do you feel protected now? Why does everybody just roll over and sheepishly comply with the face mask Nazi outside your local grocery store who tells you to put on your mask or you can't buy groceries because you're spreading disease? Masks are not a law. They are just CDC guidelines, suggestions. Everyone forgets CDC is not a branch of government. 
CDC can't make laws. CDC is a for-profit private corporation. So, why do most people wear face masks? Mostly for peer pressure these days. Because it's part of the religion, the new state religion of the germ theory of disease. It says, this is my religion. I'm a member. I'll do whatever CNN tells me to do. These face masks are nothing more than slave collars, identifying people as slaves to the new state religion. The germ theory is one of those terms that everybody uses and few people could actually define it. The germ theory holds that each disease is caused by a specific germ and then it's the job of medical science then to identify that germ, to locate that germ in you, and then to find out which drug or vaccine or potion we can give you to kill the germ in you without killing you. As simplistic as that sounds, this myth pervades all of medical science. Peer-reviewed journals, the PDR, the vast websites of CDC, NIH, and FDA. It is inescapable. Everybody believes it. So, in all fairness, we must admit that organized medicine did actually have one great triumph in the 1940s. And what was that, of course? Doctors today are still playing their only trump card. And what is that? Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin in 1928. So for one time in history, they really did pull the rabbit out of the hat. They really did find the drug that killed the bug in you that saved your life. That only happened one time in history. First of all, when you take antibiotics, it can destroy your gut flora. In addition to that, antibiotics that are given to animals whose meat we eat unless the meat is organic. Did you know that 70% of all antibiotics produced in the United States are given to animals whose meat we eat? Over-the-counter meds. All these drugs kill your gut flora. Other things that destroy your probiotics include white sugar, chlorinated water, carbonated drinks, fluoridated water, antihistamines, and coffee proliferation of opportunists like candida, dehydration, electrolyte depletion as the water leaves you, the mineral ions follow, immune suppression, chronic allergies, primary colon disease. All these are the consequences of living your life with no probiotics. Healthy people are surrounded by thousands of bacteria both within your body and around your body. All these little life forms, they're harmless to the human unless an imbalance is created by your toxic lifestyle. Germs are not the cause of disease. They are the consequences of disease. A suppressed immune system is the cause of disease. Lifestyle, nutrition, hydration, Drugs, hygiene, stress, no exercise, not being adjusted, no rest, the condition of the air and water, need for detoxification. Any of these alone can predispose to disease. Germs have nothing to do with it. They may come later as a consequence, the cleanup crew. So we learned that in the middle 1800s in Europe, the scientists were struggling with certain mysteries that they hadn't quite figured out yet. What makes something alive? Where do germs come from? Which comes first, the germ or the disease? Why do things rot, ferment, or decompose? There were two schools of thought about the nature of life at this time. The first school of thought was the germ theory of disease, and it's Chief proponent was, of course, Louis Pasteur. The holistic side of the argument was Antoine Béchamp, the Frenchman. He had a completely opposite theory, his theory of microzymas, 
and what constitutes the healthy body. The two books that best portray the contrast between Louis Pasteur and Antoine Béchamp are Béchamp or Pasteur by E. Douglas Hume and The Curse of Louis Pasteur by Nancy Appleton. There are a lot of facts about Louis Pasteur that are covered up in most modern sources, and you can learn these beginning in Hume's book. The first one you find is this, that Louis Pasteur had no training or credentials whatsoever in either medicine or physiology. He was a chemist. Then we find out that Louis Pasteur very likely created the disease known as hydrophobia, or rabies. Now, how this came about was in the cities of Europe in the 1700s and 1800s, there were a lot of stray dogs roaming around. And there were not a lot of sources of drinking water for these poor dogs. And as a consequence, they would often foam up around the mouth. So then this superstition developed that they were possessed by the devil. They were carriers of disease. Actually, this is the beginning of the whole mythology of werewolves. That's where that came from. Pasteur capitalized on this mass superstition and he created this series of vaccinations for rabies and when you really study this he killed a lot more people administering these rabies shots directly into the stomach a lot more people were killed by the shots than were ever cured this same superstition persists today with the idea of giving rabies shots to both dogs and humans just another example of forcing injections on perfectly healthy people. Something else that Pasteur did, he was the one who initiated this whole practice of vivisection with horrific animal experiments. This continues to the present day, and this is why the modern pharmaceutical industry, a lot of it is based on animal studies, even though animals may have completely different physiologies from humans. And we find that Rather than protecting the human race from disease, Pasteur may be seen more as a merchant than a scientist." Unquote. From Nancy Appleton's excellent text on Pasteur, we're reminded that another reason for Pasteur's success was his close association with Emperor Napoleon III. A police state wanted things under control as much as possible. If Pasteur can make everyone believe germs cause disease and the government can intervene with enforced injections, well, that's a match made in heaven. Sound familiar? Okay, now let's talk a little bit about Antoine Michamp. He was a legitimate scientist. He had four PhDs. He held four chairs at the prestigious University of Lille in France one of the academic centers of all of Europe at the time. He was a true Renaissance man and scientist. He was a specialist in many areas. He was a prolific author, constantly writing many books and articles his entire life. He was in the forefront of scientific knowledge of biology at that time, in the mid-1800s, late-1800s, and early 1900s. For Bichamp, Health was not merely the absence of disease, but it was a harmonious interrelationship between all the parts of the body, the holistic model. Bechamp observed these very small little bodies, and he would see them in the normal, healthy person. They looked a certain way. And then when he would take slides of a diseased person, he would see that they became transformed and looked different a cartoon from Bechamp. The theory of microzymas from Antoine Bechamp has never been disproven to the present day. Bechamp's work with microzymas did not die with him. One of his successors was the German Gunter Enderlein who renamed the microzymas endobionts. Then later on the next successor of this technology was the Canadian Gaston Nissan. He renamed these little these little beings that he saw, he renamed them somatids. This theory and technology has never been disproven. And then following Nissan's 
was Dr. Stan Bynum from National Enzyme Company. And I was lucky enough that Stan Bynum was my mentor, and he taught me bioterrain analysis and the whole technology of blood detox. The center of the immune system is in the colon, and it's the presence of probiotics that makes it the center of the immune system. So what are probiotics? Many of you will remember that they are your normal gut flora. They make sure that your food is completely digested and there is nothing left over. They are responsible for the final stage of digestion. Legitimate scientists today see germ proliferation not as the cause of disease, but rather the evidence of disease. Bernard Jensen, here's a quote from him, quote, bacteria and viruses which are cell scavengers are there because there is malnourished, enzyme depleted, diseased and necrotic tissue. They are nature's biologic sanitation department to break down and eliminate the sick tissue to prevent poisoning by the body. If you stop their action, you allow continuous poisoning by the decaying tissue. That's from Bernard Jensen. I'm just citing a few of the dozens and dozens of the best scientists who disproved Pasteur's germ theory and who realized and proved that germs in the human body were scavengers, not predators. And then the famous deathbed admission by Louis Pasteur, the germ is nothing, the terrain is everything. So he relented on his deathbed. Pasteur is said to have said that. You're sick, you have a bug, we must figure out what drug to give you. And don't worry, if it's not the right one, we have 10,000 more. One of them will definitely work. So, pseudoscientific justification for the sale of drugs and vaccines. Backed by the new pharmaceutical industry that was created by the collaboration between giants like J.D. Rockefeller, William Randolph Hearst, who controlled the media at that time, Abraham Flexner, who controlled the content of medical schools throughout the United States, and then of course, Edward Albernays, the master of creating media. The canonization of the germ theory of disease led to the birth of our $3 trillion annual empire, the pharmaceutical industry. Here's what Hume says about that. Quote, had it not been for the mass selling of vaccines, Pasteur's germ theory of disease would have collapsed into obscurity.